Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. Skipping ahead, skipping ahead. Okay, a little bit of fuzzing theory, some um, previous fuzzing with openoffice.org. You know, I'm not the first one to have done this. This has been done historically through the product for quite a while. The current approach, going through the tool set that, that we're using now, results with 4.1 to the extent um, I can speak about them. Um, we had anticipated that 4.1 would already have been released, and we've done the security bulletins and such by, by today. Um, we actually had a slight delay, so I'm not going to be able to give you as much of the details yet, you know, due to kind of responsible disclosure concerns, and then talk about a little bit about future opportunities. So what's fuzzing? Fuzzing is really taking a random data, feeding it to a program in hopes of, you know, causing some adverse behavior, usually a program fault. Um, it assumes nothing, you know, two different versions of it, a black box and a white box version. Black box fuzzing assumes nothing about the expectations of the program in terms of the underlying data formats or protocols expected, whereas white box fuzzing knows about the underlying formats and does a more targeted approach. Obviously, if you're doing black box fuzzing, it's less efficient but easier to get started. White box testing would require some upfront effort and could give you more targeted results then. The theoretical basis for fuzzing is, is pretty much like you think of the old classic um, tale that if you take a million monkeys on a million typewriters, you'll eventually you know, get some bad version of Shakespeare or maybe even a good version of Shakespeare. Of course, you also get a version of Shakespeare where Hamlet lives, but uh, many other things. It's, it's kind of taking that approach and doing it for um, testing. I actually started doing fuzzing way, way back before I even had heard of the word. It's something that I kind of independently developed back in Apache Zalin. I know a lot of people, when they think of, hear my name, they think that I started getting started with Apache with um, Open Office. But actually, I was involved way back in 1999 and 2000 with the, um, the port of Zalin, you know, the XSLT engine to C++. And one of the things we wanted to do there is do some good testing, since we anticipated some server-side users, we wanted to do some good testing of both the Xerces X XML parser as well as the, the Zalin XSLT engine to see how it would deal with um, illegal documents, whether it could cause problems. So at that point, we wrote an application that acted like a Windows editor ran a bunch of um, mutations of input XML and XSLT scripts, and then took a look at you know, running them through thousands at a time, seeing what sort of faults could be introduced. You know, the basic idea has been elaborated over the years. There's a lot more easy to use tooling around it, so you don't have to necessarily grow your own each time. But that's still the basic concept. So a little bit of the history. I found this blog post from 2011 um, where this Researcher took a look at Microsoft Office and Open Office. You know, this was back in the, the Sun era. And did fuzzing of it, looking at the earlier versions of the program. So looked at, you know, Open Office 1, Open Office 2, Open Office 3, different versions. Also looked at Microsoft Office in earlier versions and applied the same technique to each one in terms of fuzzing and looked at how many exploitable faults they could find. And as you can see, both of them have radically reduced over the years. What surprised me is that the open source version was not, it, it, it was not uncomplimentary to compare them. They, they both had improved using these techniques and both had done quite well. Um, and this is kind of a demonstration that open office through the years has been doing fuzzing and benefiting from it. Um, so just so I know, just kind of in the audience, uh, how many people out here would, would you consider to kind of be C++ programmers, have worked with C or C++? Okay. So I'll go in, and how many people have done fuzzing before? Okay. So I'll go in a little bit of the, the tool set um, of, of what we use here and, and talk a little bit about motivating, you know, kind of why we do fuzzing and what type of faults it finds and what type of faults it really doesn't find. Um, the basic, and this is kind of an oversimplification, but I guess for the benefit of those who aren't C++ programmers or who are, are C++ programmers but you haven't really gone into the bowels, is just to think of how the stack in a C program works as you're making function calls. So in this case, you know, just imagine a main function, you have a foo function, it has a local array declared, and you're copying data in here. Here it's just static data that's just there, but imagine, in general, that could be data being read in from a file, taken as user input um, from a user interface, things like that. Well, if you kind of are just thinking just a normal C program, you'd say, hmm, well, we got an array, size 9, and we're obviously copying more than 9 in there. 
what's that going to do? Well, I think most of us would say it's not going to do anything good, but let's go into a little detail of why that's bad and why that could be exploitable. So if you think of the stack before you make the call to foo here, what you're dealing with is the parameters that have been pushed into the function main as the C++ runtime started. You have a stack there, four bytes, pointing to you know, the integer, assuming your 32-bit here, and a four-byte pointer pointing to your, your, your arguments. And that's in the stack. When you make the function call, essentially what you're doing is you're pushing onto the stack here the address of the function that you're being called from. And this is the whole basis of how a C program, when you return from a function, how it knows where to go. It will read down, pop this off the stack, and this is the address that it goes to next. You're also creating a local data structure, in this case an array, on the stack as well. So the question is, what happens then when you make this, the next call, the mem copy, where you're copying more than nine bytes into that array? Well, you can imagine the mess that's caused. The amount of data that fits in the array gets stuck in there. The part that goes over wrote over your return address for the main function with data. Well, if that data was tainted, if it was something that a hacker had access to, maybe through a malformed document, um, through user input in your application, they've essentially controlled your program and now can direct it to go to a different address. You know, when the, when the, the foo function returns. So that, that's, that's generally a, a bad thing. And that's one of the types of things we're looking through when we're fuzzing. Um, you're not out of the water if you're on a, um, if you're allocating data structures on the heap. Think of whenever you have a, a um, function pointer, if you have data structures on the heap that have function pointers, the same type of thing can happen here. If you're overriding structures on the heap, you may be giving someone control over function pointers of objects on the heap. Similar forms of doing the, the structure exception handling, you know, ha kind of hacking at that. That's almost like a parallel stack of addresses that can, that can be taken advantage of. So why is this a particularly a concern for open office? It really comes down to these ancient data formats, document formats, so the one, two, three format, the, the old Excel and the binary formats. They, they were designed to be very efficient and, and the general structure of them is a binary structure where you have an integer that gives a record type, the length of the record, then a bunch of data, then another record type, then the length, then the data. And it's often processed in a way where you have a big switch statement that you go over the, the, the record types, you allocate the, the specified size as specified in the, the document, and then you, you kind of cast the, the return data to a pointer to a particular structure based on that type, and you repeat. And it's very efficient, works very well if the, the, the document's um, perfect. But you can imagine if you, someone goes in there and hacks and intentionally or accidentally changes the record length, all of a sudden you're, you're doing weird things. And that's kind of the source of, you know, if you look over the history of security patches for Microsoft Office, Open Office, um, Adobe Acrobat, for example, a lot of them are, are things where people have munged with the, the, the underlying documents and introduced faults like the ones we saw before by, by processing data structures like this. So when you think of it from the fuzzing perspective, when you think of those million monkeys, you've got to realize that it's extremely, an extremely large state space. Imagine you just had a document that was entirely five bytes long. That's all you were dealing with. Well, you'd have 256 to the power of five, or around 10 to the power of 12, different ways of mutating that single five byte file. But really, we're, we're dealing with you know, 100 kilobyte, megabyte, multiple megabyte files. You're not going to be do, doing this with monkeys. You know, we'd be here all night. It's, it's going to be much more complicated. So you have to be somewhat smart about it. This is kind of showing just the perspective from the, the testing perspective. This is a simulation, not actual data. So imagine you had a, um, a program that had one in, I think this was like one in 1,000 test cases had an error in it. And those erroneous test cases were totally randomly distributed over the entire state space. And you looked at kind of how many defects you would find 
what percentage of the defects you would find based on how many tests you'd, you'd executed. You'd essentially see this, this linear relationship that if you want to find half the defects, it would take around half the time. Well, when you're dealing with that state space of 10 to the 12th, you know, there's probably, I haven't done the calculation, but I assume I'm not going to be, I'm going to want to retire before I even get to 10% of, of the, those, those cases. So you need a smarter way of doing it as well. Well, here's the contradiction. I think anyone who's done QA work or looked at QA realizes that that's not what happens when you test typically. Typically, you see something, you see kind of a curve where it kind of uh, falls over, flattens out at the top, where you find a lot of the bugs quickly, and then you find them at a slower rate. And the question is, you know, why does that happen you know, from a theoretical perspective when you're doing testing rather than you know, the simulation that showed defects found randomly over all the test cases. And the reason why is when you're doing a test, whether you're doing it automated, and I'll assert the same thing is true when you do it through um, fuzzing, a lot of test cases, a lot of the code is covered repeatedly kind of lower down the tree. So this is just imagining you start up open office, then you do the file dialog, then you do open, and you open a PowerPoint. Test two. I'm going to do file open XLS, file open, well, that should be doc. So you can imagine the startup of the program and the file and the open get tested much more intensely. The things down here are going to be freed of defects much earlier because they're shallow. You find the shallow ones much earlier. And if you look at it just from a you know, coverage perspective, one third of the time is going to be spent one level deep on those functions. Further down, you know, one-ninth of the time, one-twenty-seventh of the time. And that's what leads to that kind of characteristic curve of testing is because you're spending more time in finding more defects in those areas that get the greater amount of coverage. So the question was, how do we simulate that effect with fuzzing so we get the, you know, similar return on our time? So the insight I had is, well, let's not start with random data or just, you know, Honestly, first iteration of this, I just did a Hello World document. I said, I'll agree. Hello World and Doc, PowerPoint, um, and, and, and just use those. And then I realized, well, that's not doing a very deep traversal. It's kind of saying, I'm just going to do file open, and then everything else is that very arduous, inefficient search. But if I take the existing documents from our Bugzilla database, collected over years, created over many different versions of OpenOffice, in, in Microsoft Office in many cases, broad feature coverage, but they also tend to be documents that are known to be buggy for one reason or another. The ones that either have crashed in the past, maybe still crash, have feature problems. Even if they were in a bug that was fixed, these are the documents that probably, I mean, I think we all know that a large percentage of bugs introduced in a product are introduced by fixes to other areas. So this becomes kind of a very efficient way, if you think of the cockroach theory. If there's one bug in that area of the code, there may be others. So a little quick tool I wrote. Not a lot of rocket science here. There's just a simple Python script. You can grab it off our SVN. Um, it's hard code to use the Apache OpenOffice instance, but um, you know, could point to the general Apache one as well. Essentially, it just downloads um, all, all the binary attachments from um, Bugzilla documents has a little bit of some caching involved to make it a little bit more efficient if you need to do repeat invocations. So what did that give us? That gave us a total of 9,602 total documents. And you can see the breakdown, as well as kind of an inordinate number of um, binary image files. That's because it's very common for someone writing a defect report to attach um, you know, a screenshot of, of showing the problem. So they weren't necessarily documents, images that had problems. They were just images illustrating other problems. But still a good number of documents to look at. Um, yeah, one last thing. I found out that there were actually, at that point, in Draw, which is our, our graphics application, um, probably around four different file formats that I could find absolutely no sample documents from. These were ancient formats. SGV, not SVG, SGV, Sun Graphics, I don't know what the hell it was, but I mean, these were formats that I had to do with some archaeology going around begging to get test documents. And that's kind of a scary thing, because that tells me if we did not have a document in SV, 
GV format in our entire subversion, that means no one the hell has ever been testing with that either. So who knows what bugs were in it. But I was able to eventually find sample documents for every single format we supported in OpenOffice. And you know some of that's in there as well. Oh, this is not SGV, but SVG. Okay, the other one? Okay. It's SVG, yeah. Okay, if you have some more, the more the merrier. Um, So second insight I had was redundancy makes this inefficient. You know, we have like 10,000 JPEG files, but only four SVM image files. You know, it would not make sense to do the fuzzing based equally on, you know, of, of the, the sample taken from Bugzilla. So one idea is, well, you could weight the file extensions equally, but that would fail to account for different complexities of the file formats themselves. I think we know, for example, you know, the TIFF image format is actually a bunch of different options within it. Um, so you'd want to give more weight to TIFF than you would necessarily to say a, a Windows bitmap. Um, so the solution would be to target code coverage. And the idea is to pick the minimum set of test files that covers the same code as the entire set of files. So if you think of the code that would be covered within OpenOffice by executing all the test files and then say what's the minimal set that will span that same amount of code coverage. In theory that would be the most efficient um, subset of the, the documents that would maximize you know, how many test runs you could do in the fuzzing. Um, I found a program just looking around for this, something called Peach Fuzzer, and they have a community edition. And one of the programs they have in there is actually called Peach Minset. And what it does is it loads, you know, it runs a command line, does a trace of the instruction set using the, the Windows debugger, and then it has a post-processing step where it will tell you what the minimum file set is. It was a bit temperamental. You can write to me if you need more information. I mean, it was things like um, it was not happy to have spaces and file names or spaces and paths and things like that, even if you quoted them. So, so there was some, you know, I had to rename all the files um, that had spaces in them and stuff like that. But overall, it worked very well. And you can see the results there. So the final min set had 17% of the doc files, 34% of the PowerPoint files, 40% of the XLS files, only 2% of the image files. So overall, the average 5% of the files, which in terms of the, the efficiency of the testing is, is a 20-fold 20, improvement. Uh, still does, yeah, I mean, I mean that, that, that's, that's something you'd like to see. And I guess I did not mention earlier, the focus of this fuzzing pass was on the, the Microsoft binary formats. I'll go into reasons why it's almost impossible to fuzz ODF or any other XML-based format um, with a black box approach. You really need a white box approach for that. The next tool I use is one from CERT, another free tool um, called Failure Observation Engine. Um, it's a fuzzing framework. The URL is there. There's also a, a Linux version that's a pretty close sister project of it, also from CERT, called Basic Fuzzing Framework, or BFF. And I did it on Windows. Why on Windows? That's where 80 percent or ni almost 90 percent of our users are of OpenOffice are on Windows. And just from, you know, maximum bang for the buck, I wanted to check faults there. Um, in the follow-up, the, the, the faults we did find were also investigated on Linux, um, you know, to confirm that they were issues there. But, you know, if I had to do another pass of this, I'd probably do the same stuff, but just do it on Linux to see if there's anything that was uniquely an issue there. So basic um, FOE f workflow, you take a seed file, so one of these peach min set files, and, and apply a fuzzer to it. And a fuzzer is a strategy for changing or modifying the file. Um, the one I did was just take a random block of, of the document and you know, mo modify the bytes in it, just randomize a section of it. It passes that file onto the OpenOffice command line. If a fault's detected, you know, a, a memory fault, um, stack overflow, um, you know, writing to a null pointer, reading from a null pointer, dereferencing, et cetera, then um, it will hook it in the debugger, try to find out where it crashed. If it's a dupe, then it skips, you know, if it's already seen the crash. Otherwise, it passes the details of the crash onto the Microsoft um, exploitable tool, which is a plug-in to the debugger that will try to classify the crash. So it uses some heuristics to determine, is this something that's not exploitable? For example, if you just dereference a null pointer, you know, that, that's not such a big deal. If you're writing, you know, past the end of the stack, that's a big deal. 
So it, it does some heuristic to rate things on whether it's exploitable, probably exploitable, not exploitable, or unknown. And then it writes out the crash plus the fuzzed in the original file. And optionally, it'll do some, like a bib section to try to minimize the, the fuzzed file. So the fuzzing initially could take a, you know, a 20 byte range of the file and randomize it. If it's a crash, it'll say, well, let's just take the first 10 bytes, see if that crashes. If not, take the second 10 bytes and try to narrow down to get the minimal changes that would be necessary to cr create the issue. It also does some kind of Bayesian machine learning in the background to kind of determine which files crash the most and also which fuzzing parameters, like the range of fuzzing that will cause the maximum amount of faults. As you can imagine, if you take a document and you change 100% of the bytes, it will not crash. It'll just load with an error message that says this file format not understood. If you only change a single byte, it might crash every thousand runs. It's very inefficient. So you kind of want to find that middle ground where you mutate it enough to cause interesting behavior, but not mutate it so much that it just becomes the uninteresting, you know, cannot load file. Um, if you think of it, that's exactly the way a dangerous virus works. If you want a, a disease to cause an epidemic, you want the virus to not kill the host immediately. That's not very interesting from a biological standpoint. You want something that infects them so they pass it on, et cetera. Okay, so beta results, and I said before here, I was being optimistic that I could provide more details in Denver, um, so I'll limit to this. So I did it in um, four virtual machines for a week, and I, I'd highly encourage anyone who does the thing, do it in a virtual machine. If you're t taking random files that random people on the web have uploaded to Bugzilla, and in this case, I turned security and open office to the lowest level because I wanted any startup macros to execute, you know, just to get fuller coverage. You know, you do not want to do this on, on you know, an important machine. In this case, nothing bad happened, but you never know. Um, it runs around 10 tests per minute for each VM. So overall in the week, it was around um, 400,000 tests. Many crashes. Over 70 of the crashes were classified as exploitable. But in the end, after analysis, it was only four root causes, and, and they're all fixed in the, the 401 GA when that goes out. So I, th I thought it was great results. Well, honestly, when we, when we saw the 70 number, we, we were all freaking out, like, oh my god. How are we going to fix these 70 issues? But it ended up they were um, you know, a small number of root causes causing all of them. And I think it was probably like maybe one root cause causing 60 of them and then the others responsible for the others. And just if you're interested, it's um, one was in the general area of the Olay compound document storage. That's kind of at the root of all the Microsoft binary f formats and then the others were application specific. So this is one approach of many. Um, fuzzing can find some things, but it's not a silver bullet. I think anyone who's kind of been in this business long enough knows that there's no single approach to QA that will find all bugs. It's really a, a task of finding a combination of techniques that are kind of orthogonal to each other that will find interesting things. Um, another one that we do with the Open Office Security team is, is static analysis with Coverity, which is you know, a complementary tool it will find things kind of deep. You know, if you remember, I had the diagram before showing, you know, file open, PowerPoint, et cetera. Coverity is great for finding something very, very deep within that tree of functionality that you will almost never get through um, with fuzzing. Um, another just suggestion, just from kind of a risk analysis, we might consider at some point retiring some of the rarely used binary formats in OpenOffice, like the S, GV or whatever to reduce exposure, or at least make them optional at install type. You know, if there's something that's so rarely used that no one's really looking at the code, well, of course, the hacker will know that's exactly the thing I want to do, and I want to throw that on a document and, and cause a problem. So you could re re reduce our exposure a little bit by making those on fewer installations. Okay, so random observations, if the time permitting. Oh, why don't I just stop? Any questions on what I've done up till now? Yeah, so the, the FOE, the question was um, for the mutation strategy, did we just do random changes to the bytes or did we do things like copying and pasting of existing data? Um, in this case, um, FOE has 
a set of predefined fuzzers that are, are written in Python, and you can extend it with your own. And um, the strategy we use here is called the byte mute. And, and what it was was just not changing the length of the document, just um, randomly putting in data at, at, uh, at given blocks. Um, it also has other strategies that you could try, such as like deleting one byte from the end of the file and just keep on truncating one byte in each time. Another strategy I played around with was changing a single byte at a time going through the entire document, or even changing each byte to each of all 256 values through the entire document. Much slower, but more comprehensive. Um, this was kind of, you know, since we've come to Apache, this is our first um, run through going through the, the fuzzing. So we, we did something that we thought would give us the kind of the greatest returns for the, the, the time spent on it. So it was doing the great, you know, mutating whole blocks. I like the idea of copying data because, in fact, one of the bugs we found had to do with um, kind of recursive data structures in, in, in um, one of the formats, which we happen to find it using this mutation strategy. But if we were copying data around, I can see that would have been found even sooner. Okay. Um, yeah, one thing that you see when you're doing this fuzzing is a lot of error message. And what struck me is just how, how many different ways we have to report that a document file is not loading properly. And I, I assume this all makes sense to the developers but from a user interface perspective. Now, this is not an actual screenshot of like a single run. This is a, obviously a composite of many runs. But you know, read error, error reading file, version incompatibility, graphics filter not found, incorrect format, incorrect file format, non-existent object. I know from a perspective from just talking to users, users hate messages that come up and say, you're screwed, okay. <laughs> I mean, who wants to say okay at that point? But it also doesn't really tell them what they need to do. But those are all better than this dialogue, ASCII filter option and filter selection. Some types of corruption of the document, and I think these are ones, you, you probably know that document formats and most other formats have some magic numbers at the very beginning of the file that give some sort of indication of what the file type is. You know, if you have a zip file, it, it's fill cats, PK, at the very beginning of the file. If that part's written over and OpenOffice can't figure out what the file format it is, it suggests that you import it as ASCII, which the user gets that dialogue and says, Western European, you know, I'm from Cincinnati, what am I gonna do there? Um, they click OK and they get a bunch of garbage on their machine. It's, it's not very friendly. Um, uh, we, we need to, I think, discuss in the project whether there's kind of a more sensitive thing we can do for that. Okay, the, the other thing you need to watch out for with fuzzing is how inefficient it is to fuzz um, raster images, you know, bitmaps and things like that. What you have with a raster image typically is a very small amount of header information generally telling you, you know, here's the palette, here's the width, here's the height, and then you have just a bunch of the image data. So you get a lot of images that have I mean, you can see exactly the fuzzing strategy because you have the image of the horse and then there's a bunch of random data on, on some of the lines. But you're not gonna really, it's like shooting a jellyfish. The vital part's there. That's where you're gonna cause the fault is changing that data. That's very inefficient. So the question is, our default format for OpenOffice is ODF. I tried fuzzing with ODF using kind of this black box approach it doesn't work because almost any change you make to an XML file is going to make it fail to become a well-formed XML file. You're going to have unmatched braces, quotation marks, illegal characters, things like that, and it won't load at all. So one thing I'm looking at is whether we can come up with a, a better mutation strategy that's targeted to XML. And some of these things would be, you know, be sensitive to the syntax of XML, but still do things like take numeric attribute values and and mutate it with some values that would be tend to cause errors. Um, you know, back back to copying existing data. You know, interchange XML IDs and ID refs. So you kind of are, are rewiring the the internals of, of the document. Interchange subtrees, replace character data, and maybe even. Um, and I haven't checked to see if anyone's done this before, but I think the holy grail would be some sort of schema directed fuzzing. Right, so FOE has two modes to, to, for dealing with XML-based formats. You can either fuzz the, our, our zip formats. You can fuzz the zip structure directly, which is interesting. You might find errors in your, your zip parsing. Or you can just say it'll take 
all the contents, it'll unzip, take all the contents, concatenate it all together, and then fuzz that. But it has no sensitivity to the XML itself. It just you know, treats it like a blob. That'd be an interesting idea, especially if the kind of the trait you're trying to to perpetuate is the ability to crash. Um, okay, not not the evolution side, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I should mention also just kind of a side effect. Even if the errors we had were not exploitable, even if they were in the lesser category. You're still improving the product. You're reducing crashes, which could have been data loss for the user. We get a lot of users with documents that crash, and usually when we run them through validators, you know, Microsoft has a nice um, binary format validator that you can download from their website. You know, we found out these are invalid Microsoft binary formats. Um, it's, you know, it's whatever tool made it wrote out an invalid file. We crash, if we can fix the crash, you know, we become a more robust application and more secure at the same time. Which is kind of a, a good goal. Yeah, the schema directed fuzzing, the, the holy grail there would be if you could just feed it the schema definition file for an XML format and have it figure out you know, how to generate. That would be more of kind of a white box approach. And oh, that would be cool. Um, making it more efficient, I'd love to do some kind of unit test level or headless, at the very least, execution. Um, to just increase the test execution rate. The more hour, or the more test cases you can run per hour, the more defects you'll find per hour. Um, if you do that, you focus on the parsing code, not the layout code, but it's also possible that your layout itself is a source of some faults. So you, you don't want to totally eliminate the kind of the interactive GUI component of it. Um, possibly for unit level fuzzing would be just to run kind of a harness around the, the file import code directly you know, without even bringing in the rest of the program. And that's the end. Take have a few more minutes. I want to take some more questions. Yes. Like an ice type de debugger? Yeah, okay. Okay. Right, right. I haven't, I mean, I, in the old days, I mean, I started off at Lotus Development Corporation doing, you know, one, one two, three, and freelance and stuff like that, and we used hardware debuggers at that time. At that time, because also we were doing our, our, some, in the early days, we had to write our own printer drivers and stuff, so we were doing device driver work. Um, I haven't done it with fuzzing. I mean, that would be kind of an intriguing possibility. I guess anything you can do to cause more errors to become detectable faults, whether you're talking about, you know, a debug malloc library, even, you know, things like that, you'd, you'd find more. But it's, I don't know, the way I look at it is, you know, we're, we're continuing the tradition that OpenOffice has done for many years of trying to keep those numbers down. A little bit of kind of hiatus and transition as we came to Apache, and I'm kind of glad to see the dev team coming together and, and, and you know, working on these issues again. Yeah. 